Chapter Ten of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Ten An Unexpected Meeting. It's a nice place for a camp, isn't it, youngster? very nice sergeant but it will soon be spoiled with all these troops arriving it is very pretty now with that grove of palm trees and the low green bushes that hide the sand and the river with all the boats with white sails i have just been counting them there are thirty-two in sight but when we get three or four regiments here they will soon cut down the scrub and spoil its appearance altogether that is so lad troops make a pretty clear sweep of everything where they settle down edgar had taken a good deal to sergeant bowen who had shown him many little kindnesses on the way up he was an older man than most of those engaged in the expedition and edgar judged him to be thirty-two or thirty-three years old he was a fine tall soldierly-looking fellow and had served in various parts of the world let us sit down the sergeant said this bush will give us a little shade. How long have you been in the army, lad? Better than two years. Directly the campaign is over, I shall give up my trumpet, and hope I shall get my stripes soon. How old are you, nineteen? Not for some months yet, sergeant. Hope to get your commission some day, the sergeant said. I suppose that is what you entered the army for. Yes, partly, sergeant, partly because I saw no other way of keeping myself but what are your friends doing i have not any friends at least none that i care to apply to edgar answered shortly no friends lad that is bad but i do not want to know your story if you do not choose to tell it it is easy to see that you have had a good education keep steady lad and you will get on i might have been a quartermaster years ago if it hadn't been for that drink and other things have kept me down but when I was twenty I was a smart young fellow. Ah, that is a long time back. Why, one would think that you were an old man, sergeant, Edgar said and smiled. Older than you would think by a good bit. How old do you take me to be? Something past thirty. A good deal past that. I am just forty, though they don't know it, or I should not be here. Why, then, if you enlisted when you were my age, sergeant, you must have done over twenty years service it's twenty-two since i first enlisted i served eight years in the infantry i don't know why i'm telling you this but somehow i have taken a fancy to you i was uncomfortable in the regiment it does not matter why i got my stripes twice and had to give them up or i should have been put back for drinking then i left the regiment without asking leave I was three or four years knocking about at home, but I had no trade and found it hard to get work, so at last I enlisted again. I was thirty then, but looked years younger than I was. Of course I had shaved off my mustache and put on a smock frock when I went to enlist, and I gave my age as twenty-two. No one questioned it. I chose the cavalry this time because I knew that if I entered an infantry regiment again they would spot me as an old soldier at once, but as it was all new in the cavalry I managed to pass it off, and now I have had ten years' service, the last six of them, as sergeant, and as I gave up drink years ago I have a good character in the regiment, and when a steady non-commissioned officer was wanted for the business I had the luck to be chosen officers coming lad they rose to their feet and saluted as three officers passed they were talking eagerly together and returned the salute mechanically without glancing at the two soldiers it is a rum chance clinton our meeting here i ran against skinner at assouan quite accidentally i had seen his name in the list of the officers of the marines going up but we met quite by chance and only foregathered here yesterday and now here you are turning up as one of stuart's a d c s who would have thought that we three should meet here when we have never seen each other since we left cheltenham 
the sergeant stood looking after them with an air of interest till their voices died away then he turned to his companion hello lad what is the matter are you ill no i am all right edgar said huskily nonsense your colour has all gone and you are shaking like a leaf what did you know any of those officers i knew them all once edgar said we were at school together i did not know that any of them were out here i would not have them recognize me for anything oh that is it i thought you must have run away from school got into some scrape i suppose well my lad as you have made your bed you must lie in it but it is not likely that any of them would know you even if they ran up against you two years service under this sun changes a lad of your age wonderfully by the way one of them called the other clinton do you happen to know whether he is the son of a captain clinton captain percy clinton yes he is he was the captain of my company when i was a young sergeant well well time flies fast to be sure do you know whether this young fellow has a brother and if so what he is doing no he has no brother edgar said shortly there were two of them the sergeant said positively perhaps one has died i wonder which it was he muttered to himself do you know the story edgar asked suddenly do i know the story the sergeant repeated slowly what story do you mean the story of captain clinton's baby being confused with another oh you know about that do you sergeant bowen asked in turn so they made no secret of it ay lad i know it every man in the regiment knew it and good cause i had to know it it was that that ruined me are you sergeant humphreys edgar asked putting his hand on the man's shoulder the sergeant started in surprise why lad how come you to know all the ins and outs of that story i i was sergeant humphreys and for aught i know that young fellow who has just passed whom they call clinton is my son no he is not sergeant i am your son the sergeant looked at the young trumpeter in bewilderment then his expression changed you have got a touch of fever lad come along with me to the hospital i will report you sick the sooner you are out of the sun the better i am as sensible as i ever was in my life edgar said quietly i was brought up by captain clinton as his son i was at cheltenham with rupert clinton who has just passed us we believed that we were twins until the day came when a woman came down there and told me the story and told me that i was her son and yours then i ran away and here i am my wife the sergeant exclaimed passionately i have not seen or heard of her for fifteen years so she came down and told you that she is a bad lot if ever there was one and so she told you you were my son you may be lad for aught i know and i should be well content to know that it was so but what did she come and tell you that for what game is she up to now i always knew she was up to some mischief what was her motive in coming down to tell you that just let me know what she said she said she had deliberately changed me as an infant for my good and she proposed to me to continue the fraud and offered if i liked to swear to rupert's being her child so that i might get all the property and that she might share in it the sergeant laughed bitterly a bold stroke that of jane humphreys and how did she pretend to recognize you as her child more than the other she told me that captain clinton's child had a tiny mole on his shoulder and as rupert has such a mark that settled the question jane humphreys told you more than she knew herself whether she intended to make the change of babies or not i don't know but i believe she did but whether it was done by chance or whether she purposely mixed them up together one thing i am certain of and that is that she confused herself as well as every one else and that she did not know which was which when i came into the room first she was like a woman dazed and clever as she was i am sure she was not putting it on she had thought i fancy that she could easily distinguish one from the other 
and had never fancied that she could have been confused as well as other people she undressed them and looked them over and over and it was then she noticed the little mole on the shoulder and she turned to me and said if i had but noticed this before i should always have told them apart we had a pretty bad time of it afterwards for it made me the laugh of the whole regiment and caused no end of talk and worry and we had frightful rows together she taunted me with being a fool for not seeing that there was money to be made out of it she acknowledged to me over and over again that she had intended to change the children and had dressed them both alike and when i asked her what good had come out of her scheming she said that in the first place we had got rid of the bother of bringing up the boy and that if i were not a fool we might make a good thing out of it yet but she was vexed and angry with herself for not having seen this little mark and for having herself lost all clue as to which was her child i told her that as she had intended to change them she could have cared nothing for her own boy and that her only object could have been to make money she did not deny it but simply jeered at me for being content to remain all my life a non-commissioned officer when there might be a fortune made out of this i do not say that if she had been able to tell one child from the other she would have told me for if she had i should certainly have gone to captain clinton and told him but she did not know a woman can act well but she cannot make herself as white as a sheet and put such a wild look into her eyes as she had when i found her turning those children over and over and trying to make out which was which i could take the bible in my hand and swear in court that jane humphreys knew no more than i did which was her child that she had never noticed the mark until after the change was made and that to this day she does not know one of the points we quarrelled on was that i made her start for the captain's quarters in such a hurry she afterwards said that when it first came across her that she did not know which child was which her blood seemed to go up into her head and she lost her power of judgment altogether she said over and over again that if i hadn't hurried her so and had let matters be a day or two so that she could have slept on it and had looked at them quiet she would have known which was her child so that is how it is lad you may be jane humphrey's child and mine or you may be captain clinton's but no living soul can decide which as to jane humphrey's she is a liar and a thorough bad un and if it is only on her word that you have run away you have made a bad mistake of it still it is not too late to put that right my word is as good as hers and as she swore before she did not know which was which her swearing now that she does after all these years will go for nothing at all edgar was silent for some time then he said i have thought a good many times since i ran away that i was wrong in not waiting to hear what captain clinton said but i had no reason to doubt the story she told me and when she proposed that i should go on with this fraud and cheat rupert out of his position as heir it was too horrible and the thought that such a woman was my mother was altogether too much to bear i will not make such a mistake again or act in a hurry my present thought is that as i have chosen my way i will go on in it before captain clinton and his wife did not know which was their child and loved us both equally now that they believe that rupert is their son and that i was a fraud they will have come to give him all of their love and i am not going to unsettle things again that is my present idea and i do not think that i am likely to change it i shall be glad to know that i need not consider myself that woman's child though it would not grieve me now that i know you to be sure that you were my father but captain clinton and his wife were a father and mother to me up to the day when i ran away and i could never think of any one else in that light quite natural quite natural lad you have never seen me or heard of me and it would be a rum thing if you could all of a sudden come to care a lot about me i know that you may be my son but i don't know that at present 
i like you any the more for that than i did before so we are quite of one mind over that but we will be friends lad stout friends that we will edgar said clasping warmly the hand the other held out to him you have been very kind to me up to now and now that at any rate we may be father and son we shall be drawn very close together when this campaign is over it will be time to talk again about the future i do not think now that i am at all likely to change my mind or to let the clintons know what you have told me but i need not trouble about it in any way until then i was contented before and i am contented now if i have made a fool of myself as i think i have i must pay the penalty i have much to be thankful for i had a very happy time of it until the day i left cheltenham i have had a good education and i have a first-rate chance of making my way up i have made friends of some of the officers of my regiment and they have promised to push me on i had the luck to attract the colonel's attention at el teb and was among the names sent in for the victoria cross and although i did not get it the fact that i was recommended will count in my favor you are the right stuff lad the sergeant said putting his hand on his shoulder whether i or the captain was your father i reckon that it was he i don't see where you can have got what there is in you from our side and now it is time to be going back to camp who would have thought when we strolled out here together that so much was to come out of our walk while this conversation had been going on rupert clinton and his two old schoolfellows were sitting on the ground in the tent which easton shared with another of general stuart's aides-de-camp the scene has changed easton said as he handed them each a tumbler of weak rum and water otherwise one might imagine that we were in my study at river smith's and that skinner was about to lay down the law about the next football match ah if we had but edgar here rupert sighed i did not like to ask whether you had found him clinton but i guessed you had not by your keeping silence no we have not heard anything of him beyond the fact that we have occasionally a letter saying that he is well and comfortable they were all posted in london but i still believe that he is in the army my father is as convinced as ever that the statement of that woman i told you of was a false one and that edgar is just as likely to be his son as i am i know i would gladly give up my share of the airship to find him however unless i run against him by pure chance i am not likely to do that we still put in advertisements occasionally but my people at home are as convinced as i am that we shall not hear from him until he has made his way in some line or other and he is in an independent position he always was a sticker skinner said and if he took a thing in hand would carry it through you remember his rush in our last match with greens how he carried the ball right down through them all i should not worry about it clinton it will all come right in time he will turn up some day or other and when he finds that matters are just as they were before and that your people believe him to be just as likely to be their son as you are he will fall into his old place again at least that is my opinion of it yes that is what i hope and believe rupert said well easton how do you like the guards and how do you like campaigning i see that you have given up white shirts like the rest of us i rather expected that if we did meet i should find that in some miraculous way you still contrived to get up immaculately easton laughed no i left my last white shirt at cairo clinton i consulted my soldier servant about it he was ready to guarantee the washing but he did not see his way to starching and ironing so i had to give them up and take to flannels they were awful at first and irritated my skin until they brought on prickly heat and i was almost out of my mind for a few days however i have got over it now what made you go into the marine skinner well just before the exam came off an uncle of mine who is a great friend of the first lord wrote to say that he could give me a commission 
well in the first place i did not feel very sure of passing for the line in the second place i had a liking for the sea and in the third place as my governor's living is not a very large one and i have a lot of sisters and i thought i had had more than my share already in being sent to cheltenham and one can live a good deal cheaper in the marines than in the line i concluded the best thing i could do was to accept the offer and i have not been sorry that i did it it was awful luck my coming out in the naval brigade here it was just a fluke the man who was going off chucked off a horse and broke his arm the day before the brigade sailed from suakim and i was sent up in his place well what is the last news clinton you ought to know as you are on the staff they don't entrust aides de camp with their secrets rupert replied but i think it likely there will be a move in a day or two and that the camel corps will push across to metama and wait there till the boats get round yes that is what everyone is talking about easton said the question that is agitating us is whether all the camel corps will go and if not which will be chosen ah that i know nothing about easton but i should think if any go the guards would be sure to be in it but whether the heavies or the lights will go if only two are chosen i cannot say i should fancy one will go with the boats anyhow so as to keep along parallel with them and protect them against any sudden attack while they are afloat will the chief go on do you think not if only a small body cross the desert at least i should think not i should say he would stay here until metama is occupied and the boat column is well on its way and that then he will go on to metama and take the command there when the whole force is assembled in that case stuart would of course command the desert column and i should be all right the great question is will the beggars fight skinner remarked and if so where they are sure to fight easton said i don't think there is the least doubt about that but i should not think there will be any fighting this side of metama it will be somewhere between that and khartoum the mahdi cannot help fighting after smashing up hicks and giving himself out as invincible he would lose his hold altogether of the people if he did not come down and fight of course there is no doubt about the result but judging from the way those fellows fought down by the red sea it is likely to be pretty tough work i shall be sorry for the poor beggars with their spears against our breech-loaders but it has got to be done skinner and rupert both laughed for easton spoke exactly as he used to do with regard to football it will be a nuisance your having to exert yourself won't it easton yes that is always a nuisance and in a climate like this easton said seriously why nature made a place so hot i cannot make out i am sure if i were to be weighed i should find i had lost nearly a stone since i came out you have quite enough flesh on you skinner said critically if you have lost a stone you must have been getting beastly fat you fellows in the guards do not take enough exercise the time was when the guards used to row and had a very good eight but they never do that sort of thing now it would do you all a lot of good if instead of wandering between london and windsor and dublin you were to take your turn for foreign service but then we should not be guards skinner well you would be none the worse for that skinner retorted he is just as bad as he used to be clinton easton laughed just the same aggressive pugnacious beggar that he was at river smith's he means well easton we never expected more than that from him he must make himself fearfully obnoxious to the fellows who have the misfortune to be shut up on board ship with him i shall make myself obnoxious to you clinton if you don't look out it is only the heat that protects you have you met any others of our fellows out here not from our house but i know there are seven or eight fellows of about our own standing out here altogether if we are up here in the cold weather skinner said that is if there ever is any cold weather we will get a football made and challenge a team from any other school 
don't talk about it easton said plaintively it throws me into a perspiration even to think about it the dust would be something awful possibly if we are up here through the winter or through the period they are pleased to call winter we might get up cricket but as for football it is out of the question of course if we were stationed at dongola or berber or khartoum we could get the bats and stumps and things sent up to us it would be fun if it were only to see how these lazy squatting beggars would stare when they saw us at it but you were never enthusiastic about cricket no but then you see i do not propose to play on our side my idea is that i should sit down on the sands in the shade of the scrub and smoke my pipe quietly that is the oriental idea of taking exercise pay somebody to dance for you and sit and watch them but do not think of attempting to take a hand yourself it would be fatal to any respect these egyptians may feel for us if they were to see us rushing about the sand like maniacs in pursuit of a ball however though i should not play myself i should take a lively interest skinner in seeing you and clinton working hard but i must be going it is near time for us to parade come across to my tent at nine o'clock this evening i cannot ask you to dinner that must be deferred until we get home again but we can smoke a pipe and talk over old days and i can give you a glass of good brandy and water which is a change from the commissariat rum i managed to smuggle up half a dozen bottles edgar was much disturbed by the story he had heard so unexpectedly from the sergeant he regretted now that he had acted so hastily certainly the story put a completely new complexion on the case and his chance of being captain clinton's son was just the same as it had ever been he wondered whether his father and mother for so in his thoughts he always named them had doubted the truth of this woman's statement to him or whether they had believed it as he had done and had put him out of their hearts as one with whom they had nothing to do and who had been already too long imposed upon them but he felt that this was an unjust view and that however they might now be confident that rupert was their son and heir they still cherished an affection towards him however he said this will make no difference to me the die is cast and i cannot go back now still i shall be happier than i was before then i considered that i had been an impostor who had received affection and care and kindness to which i had no shadow of right now i know that this is not so and that it is just as likely that i am their son as it is that rupert is and i stay away for my own choice and because having made them believe that rupert was their son i am not going to disturb and make them unhappy again by showing them that this was a mistake and that everything is as unsettled as before i told them that they would never hear of me until i had made my own way and i shall stick to that who would have thought of meeting rupert here it has been a great piece of luck for him getting out here as general stuart's aide-de-camp but i know the general is a friend of my father and that accounts for it perhaps this sergeant is my father i did not seem to mind the thought before i did not even know whether he was alive and never really faced it and yet if sergeant bowen is to be my father he is as good as another he seems a fine fellow and has had no hand in this fraud i ought indeed to think myself lucky for he is steady and respectable a good soldier and i can see liked by the officers as well as by the men it was curious that he should have taken a fancy to me still it does go against the grain though i can see he has no intention of claiming me openly as his son if he had i think i should have kicked against it but as it is i am sure we shall be very good friends after drill was over the next morning and the camels had been seen to and the men dismissed sergeant bowen came up to him let us take another turn together lad i have been thinking a lot he went on when they were beyond the lines of our talk yesterday now lad you have been brought up as a gentleman and to consider yourself as captain clinton's son 
remember i don't want you to think that i expect you to make any change about that i have done nothing for you as a father and whether i am your father or not you do not owe me anything and i want to tell you again that i don't expect in the least that because it is possible you are my son you should regard me in the light of your father i can understand that after all your life looking at the captain as your father and after he and his wife being everything to you you would find it mighty hard to regard me in that way i don't expect it and i don't want it if he is not your father by blood he is your father in right of bringing you up and caring for you and educating you and it is quite right and quite proper that you should always regard him so you can look upon me lad just as a foster father as the husband of the woman who was for a time your nurse and who would gladly repair the wrongs he did to you i just say this lad to make things straight between us i want us to be friends i am an old soldier and you a young one we are comrades in this expedition we have taken to each other and would do each other a good turn if we had a chance i don't want more than that lad and i don't expect you to give more if i can lend you a helping hand on or off duty you know i shall do so so let us shake hands on it and agree to let the matter drop altogether until this campaign is over then we will talk over together what had best be done a few months longer of this life will do you no harm and you will make all the better officer for having had two or three years in the ranks but i will say at once that i think you are wrong now you know how the matter stands in not writing at once to the captain and letting him know the truth still there is no harm in its standing over for the present you must go through the expedition as you are now and they would be no easier for knowing that you are exposed to danger out here than they are at present when they know nothing of your whereabouts edgar shook the sergeant heartily by the hand and the bargain was sealed every day troops kept on arriving and by the twenty seventh of december there were already at cordy a considerable portion of the sussex the duke of cornwall's light infantry the essex gordon highlanders black watch and stratfordshire all of whom had come up in the whaleboats a large number of the commissariat transport hospital and engineer train in native boats the whole of the guards camel corps and the greater portion of the heavy and light camel corps a hundred men of the marines who were provided with camels and appointed to form part of the guards camel corps two squadrons of the nineteenth hussars and the mounted infantry in the few days that had passed since the troops to which edgar was attached had arrived at cordy the change in the appearance of the place was great the grove of palm trees still stood near the bend of the river but the green fields of grass and the broad patches of growing crops had been either levelled or trampled down and the neighbourhood of the camp presented the appearance of the sandy wastes of aldershot on the evening of that day skinner rushed into easton's tent i have just seen clinton he said and the rumors are going to be fulfilled at last they did not inspect our water-skins arms and accoutrements for nothing to-day we are to start on the thirtieth across the desert there is no secret about it or of course clinton wouldn't have told me there are to be our regiment a squadron of hussars the mounted infantry and engineers we are to take with us baggage camels and the camels of the heavy and light regiments we are going to gakdul about a hundred miles off there all the stores are to be left and the camels and mounted infantry to come back here we are to remain to guard the stores as soon as the camels return here the heavies are to take their own beasts and with the mounted infantry escort every baggage animal that can be got up here when we shall all go on together sir herbert stuart commands what about baggage easton asked after expressing his deep satisfaction that the advance was about to begin only what we can carry ourselves on our camels and the weight is limited to forty pounds 
which is abundant even for sybarites like you guardsmen a quarter of that would be amply sufficient for me a couple of blankets a waterproof sheet half a dozen flannel shirts ditto socks pair of slippers and a spare khaki suit sponge toothbrush and a comb what can any one want more i should like to take my waterproof bath easton said pooh nonsense man where are you going to get your water from there is water at gactel and there will be plenty when we get to metama easton said well i will grant that skinner said but anyhow you can manage very well as we do make a hole in the sand and put your waterproof sheet into it and there you have got as good a bath as any one can want what is the use of lumbering yourself up with things you do not want much better take those three bottles of brandy you have got left and a couple of pounds of tobacco that is the utmost allowance i should give the camels will have to go a long time without water and the less you put on their backs the better you know what a difference a few pounds makes to a horse and i suppose it must be the same thing with them at three o'clock on the afternoon of the thirtieth the force intended for the desert march paraded and after marching past lord wolseley moved off in solid formation thirty camels abreast the total force consisted of seventy-three officers one thousand two hundred twelve men and natives and two thousand ninety one camels the whole camp had turned out to see the departure of the column and edgar with his helmet pressed down low over his eyes watched rupert as he rode after sir herbert stuart and easton and skinner with the guards camel corps the heavies had been much disappointed at not forming part of the first advance and especially at their camels being taken for baggage animals but they consoled themselves by the fact that the native spies all reported that there were no bodies of the enemy between cordy and gactel and it was not likely therefore that there should be any fighting until the whole force moved forward together from gactel to metama in front of the column were half a dozen natives on camels these acted as the guides of the party they had been extremely unwilling to go and it was only when the general offered them the alternative of going willingly and receiving good pay for their work or being lashed to their camels and forced to go without any pay whatever that they elected the first the hussars scouted in front of the column riding far ahead and scouring the country in search of lurking foes two hours after starting there was a halt fires were lighted from the dry grass and mimosa bushes and tea was made and served out by this time it was five o'clock and the sun had set in an hour or two the moon which was nearly full rose and afforded ample light for the journey for a time the silence of the desert was broken by the laughter and talk of the men but as the time went on the sounds were hushed as sleepiness fell upon them short halts were of frequent occurrence as the baggage animals in the rear lagged behind or their loads slipped and had to be readjusted then a trumpet was sounded by the rear guard and it was repeated by the trumpeters along the column and all came to a halt until the trumpet in the rear told that the camels there were ready to advance again so the march continued throughout the whole night the ground was of hard sand or gravel with round smooth hills of dark stone rising from it near the hills the ground was covered with low mimosa bushes and long yellow grass and in some places the mimosa trees rose to a length of ten or twelve feet at five o'clock day broke and at half past eight the column halted at a spot where there were a good many trees here they dismounted breakfasted and slept for some hours at three in the afternoon they started again and at half past eight arrived at the first wells those of hambach but as they were found to contain very little water the march was continued to the el howiet wells thirteen miles farther before they got there the watches told that midnight had arrived and the commencement of the new year was hailed with a burst of cheering and singing broke out all along the line and was continued for an hour 
until they reached the wells there was but little water here but the men carried theirs in skins the horses of the nineteenth hussars received a bucketful apiece which exhausted the supply of the wells at six o'clock in the morning they again advanced and after a rest of three hours at midday continued their way until midnight when a light being seen at a distance the column was halted and the hussars went out and captured a caravan loaded with dates for the use of the mahdi troops it was not until eight o'clock in the morning that the weary troops and animals reached the wells of gakdul end of chapter ten chapter eleven of dash for khartoum this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah dash for khartoum by george alfred henty chapter eleven abu Klea. where on earth are the wells skinner said to the officer who was riding next to him and a similar question was asked by scores of others they had advanced through a narrow pass and were now in a small flat surrounded apparently on all sides by hills however as major kitchener the head of the intelligence department and the native guides were there every one supposed it was all right and set to work to unload the camels it was not such easy work as usual for the ground was strewn with large stones upon which the camels objected strongly to kneel for a time there was a prodigious din the camels grumbling and complaining the natives screaming the soldiers laughing shouting and using strong language at last the loads were all off the stores piled and the din quieted down where on earth is this water skinner easton asked as the two young officers met after the work was done i cannot make out easton i hope it is not far for my water-skin has leaked itself empty and my throat is like a furnace i have some water in mine easton said but it tastes of leather so strongly that it is next to undrinkable oh here is clinton where is the water clinton by the rock at the end of the valley i am just going to have a look at it can you come yes there is nothing to do here at present they hurried towards the rock that clinton pointed out and when they reached it they still saw no signs of water but on going round it burst into a shout of delight before them lay a pool some sixty feet wide by a hundred long the rocks rose precipitously on each side it was evident that the water was deep there are two more pools further up an officer who had got there before them said let us climb up and have a look clinton said and with some difficulty they climbed to the top of the rock going along for some little distance they looked down eighty feet below them lay two beautiful pools they were evidently very deep for at the edge the water was green but nearly black in the centre of the pools this is something like skinner said there is no fear of running short of water come on let us clamber down and get a drink look there at the rows of camels coming along to the lower pool i suppose that will be kept for them and that we shall get our water from these with a good deal of difficulty they got down but were unable to reach the edge however they tied a string round one of their water bottles and soon brought it up full the water was deliciously clear and cool the high rock completely sheltering the pools from the heat of the sun they indulged in several long draughts before their thirst was satisfied i shall never say anything against water again skinner remarked i have always allowed its utility for washing purposes but have considered it a distinct failure as a drink i recant well considering that at home beer is good enough for me i am prepared to maintain that in the middle of the bayuda desert clear cold water and plenty of it is good enough for any one but how in the world are we going to get at this water oh here come the engineers they are going to do it somehow 
a party of engineers arrived with some pumps and a hundred yards of hose how are you going to take it down we are going to lead the hose right through the lower pool letting it lie at the bottom that is the only way we can do it there is no way of fixing it against that wall of rocks the pumps were fixed in a very short time and the hose laid and in less than an hour the stream of pure water was being poured into a large trough placed near the lower pool and from this the cooks of the various companies filled their kettles and boilers some of the men in spite of their long and fatiguing journey had followed the example of the young officers and filled their water bottles as they had done but the majority had thrown themselves on the ground and were fast asleep a few minutes after the work of unloading the camels had been completed for hours the work of watering the camels went on slowly at first as only a few could drink at a time but more rapidly when large troughs were erected at which thirty could be watered at once as soon as dinner was over the guards set to work to erect two forts that the engineers had already marked out one of these was at the mouth of the pass leading into the little valley the other was placed just above the pools the baggage was piled close to the wells by evening the work was well advanced and at eight o'clock the mounted infantry and the whole of the camels started on their return journey leaving the guards with fifteen engineers and six hussars to hold the wells and guard the great pile of stores that had been brought up as soon as work was over there was a general movement to the wells and there were few who did not indulge in the luxury of a bath in the lower pool rupert clinton returned with the column to cordy as general stuart went back with them to bring out the main body of troops it was calculated that ten days must elapse before these would arrive at gakdul and the guards and marines set to work in earnest the next morning to get things into order the work was very heavy but as the men had plenty to eat and no lack of excellent water they did not mind it congratulating themselves heartily upon the fact that they had not to make the long and wearisome journey to cordy and back in the course of the ten days the walls of the forts rose to a height of over five feet a very laborious piece of work for one fort measured twenty yards by twenty-three the other thirty yards by fifteen and the stones had all to be picked up and carried considerable distances or loosened out of the solid rock by aid of the six pickaxes and four crowbars that were alone available in addition to this the site of a camp was marked out roads were formed by clearing away the stones and paths made up to the forts and picket stations the outpost duty was very severe two officers and sixty men being always on duty as it was possible that at any time night or day an attack might be made this is awful easton said to skinner as sitting down on the ground he mournfully contemplated his boots these boots that i relied upon to last me through the campaign are hopelessly done for they do look bad skinner agreed but no worse than mine or in fact than any one else's these rocks are awful if nature had scattered ten million knives broadcast about this valley they could not have been more destructive to boots than these rocks i used to think that although the camels were well enough for taking up the baggage or as a means of conveyance for men they were a mistake and that it would be much pleasanter to march than to sit upon these wearisome beasts but my opinion has been changed by our experience here if we had to march many miles over such a country as this the whole force would be barefooted i had a frightful job of it last night i went the rounds with the field officer and how it was i didn't break my neck i cannot imagine i had a dozen tremendous croppers down the rocks the lantern went out the first time and got smashed the second the major seemed to think that it was my duty to have kept it alight whatever happened to myself and was as savage as a bear we lost our way a dozen times and once came up to a picket on the wrong side 
and deuced near got potted i know all about it easton said i did it three nights ago and have no skin at present on my knees or my elbows or my hips and mighty little on my back i went down one place fifty or sixty feet deep head foremost bumping from rock to rock and it flashed through my mind as i did so what an ass i was to be going through all this when i might be comfortably in bed at home they don't tell one of these things he said plaintively when they talk of the advantages of the army bosh skinner said wrathfully i don't suppose you were a bit more hurt than you would be in a good close rally at football it is a thousand times better after all than mooning about windsor or being mewed on board a ship at suakim however i shall be precious glad when the others arrive and we have done with this fatigue work the men's hands are pretty well cut to pieces getting up and carrying those sharp rocks and i am heartily tired of acting as a sort of amateur mason on the eleventh of january a convoy of a thousand camels with stores and ammunition arrived and the next day the troops were delighted at seeing the main body approaching in addition to the mounted infantry and heavy camel corps four hundred men of the sussex regiment came up on the camels they were intended to garrison the forts and protect the wells when the rest of the force moved forward but a hundred of them were to go forward with the troops with the newcomers were thirty sailors with a gardener gun thirty men of the royal artillery with three seven-pounder guns forty-five of the medical and commissariat staff and one hundred twenty native drivers for the baggage camels as the heavy camel regiment numbered three hundred eighty and the guards three hundred sixty seven the mounted infantry three hundred sixty and there were ninety men of the nineteenth hussars and one hundred of the sussex the total force which was to advance was about fifteen hundred men ninety horses and two thousand two hundred camels all the men with the exception of the natives who were on foot were mounted on camels the hussars of course accepted as they rode sturdy little egyptian horses which although little larger than ponies were capable of enduring an amount of fatigue hardship and privation that would in the course of a few days have rendered english horses useless those who had left gakdul but ten days before were astonished at the change which the labors of the guards camel corps had effected in it and great commendation was given them by the general for the zeal with which they had worked large as was the number of animals to be watered the work was conducted with far greater speed and ease than had been the case on their former arrival the arrangements were all excellent and in a comparatively short time the whole were watered and fed the troops however were dismayed at the change which had come over the camels these animals are capable of enduring great fatigue and scarcity of water and food but the authorities had acted as if there were no limits whatever to those powers and for a fortnight the camels had been kept at work with only three or four hours rest out of each twenty-four with a very scanty supply of food and a sufficient allowance of water but twice namely at gakdul and korti the natural result had followed the animals were weak and exhausted the majority were suffering from sore backs some had already succumbed others were absolutely incapable of further work until they had had a rest in this respect none of the three corps had any advantage over the other as the camels had all performed the three journeys if we are only going to metnama and are to halt there until the boats come round the poor beasts will have time to recover before we want them again easton said to skinner as they were looking ruefully at the condition of the camels who had carried them so well ten days before but they certainly won't be fit to advance for some time i am afraid skinner that they must have very bad news from khartoum and that every day is of extreme importance if the matter hadn't been most urgent they would never have ruined the whole of our transport as they have done in this way 
if the camels had had a couple of days rest here before starting to go back again and four or five days good feeding at cordy before they started up again it would have made all the difference in the world to them a camel is not a steam engine that can take in fuel and water and be off again an hour after it comes in from a journey i don't like these night marches skinner said i consider them to be a mistake altogether so do i skinner it was bad enough when we had the moon but it will be ten times worse now as to the heat that is all rot we travelled in the daytime coming up by the banks of the nile and it is cooler now than it was then it is all very well for men to march at night if they have no animals or baggage train with them but it is a different thing altogether on such an expedition as this to begin with the delays from falling behind and readjusting baggage are far greater at night than at day there is much greater difficulty in keeping the column together the men are in a state of drowsiness the whole time if they were marching they would keep awake but sitting on the camels there is nothing to rouse them then when they get in camp the heat of the day has just begun and what with that and the flies it is next to impossible to sleep what sleep they get does not refresh them i quite dread this march on to metema however it has got to be done but certainly i should not mind it half so much if we were going to travel by daylight it was soon known that there was to be no delay at gechtel and orders were issued that the start was to be made on the thirteenth the intervening day being devoted to seeing to the arms and ammunition issuing stores and replenishing the water supply the water skins were extremely defective leaking freely the only exception being the india rubber bags with which the sailors had been supplied every effort was made during the halt to sew up holes and stop leaks but with poor success each man carried on his camel one of these skins in addition to his water bottle strict orders were given that upon the march he was to rely upon the latter alone the supply in the skins being for general purposes such as cooking and making tea during the halt edgar applied himself steadily to the work of repairing the water skins the camp of the heavies joined that of the guards and he felt that his danger of being recognized by easton or skinner was great but sitting with a group of others sewing with his face shaded by his helmet the risk was very much less than if standing up or moving about the camp at two o'clock in the afternoon the force paraded and moved off in columns of companies the heavy camel corps led the guards followed the baggage and stores were in the centre and the mounted infantry in the rear many of the camels had to be left behind and those that remained were only sufficient to carry the absolutely necessary stores the rations for the men and a quantity of corn that would suffice but to give two feeds of eight pounds each to the animals who were therefore obliged to depend almost entirely on such sustenance as they could pluck from the mimosa shrubs and the dry yellow grass the men carried a hundred and seventy rounds each there were a hundred rounds per gun for the artillery but only a thousand rounds were brought for the gardener gun a quantity sufficient but for five minutes work when in action the journey was over a gravelly plain and the halt was made at six o'clock in the evening fires were lit of the shrubs and dry grass the camels were unloaded and fed and were ranged in such order that in case of attack the troops could form square at the angles of the mass and thus support each other and protect the convoy at three in the morning the trumpets and bugles sounded the fires were soon blazing again and at half past four breakfast had been eaten the camels loaded and the column on its march again at ten o'clock there was a halt for two hours for dinner and a short rest and it was not until just as they were going to start that the rear guard arrived having been delayed by the breaking down of numbers of the camels many of which had fallen dead as they walked while others incapable of movement had to be left behind to take their chance of recovering sufficiently to browse upon the bushes and make their way back to the wells 
as the bands of those that fell had to be distributed among their already exhausted companions the prospect was far from cheerful starting at twelve the column passed a conical hill known as gebel el nur an hour later and entered a broad valley covered with grass and trees twenty feet high and where doubtless water could be obtained had the force been provided with little abyssinian pumps at five o'clock the column halted and as the ground was sandy passed a more comfortable night than the one before every one was in good spirits the men found the journeys by day far less fatiguing than those at night and were able to obtain refreshing sleep in the cool night air before daybreak they again started over a gravelly plain hoping to reach the wells of abu Klea that evening they halted at eleven in a valley flanked by hills the track according to the maps lay over a steep hill in front and then along a pass between the two hills the wells lying some three miles beyond the pass dinner was cooked and as soon as they had finished their meal the hussars started for the wells as their horses had had no water since leaving gakdal the rest of the force were stretched upon the ground taking it quietly when two of the hussars returned at full gallop with a message to the general and the order was immediately issued for the men to fall in and for the officers to examine their arms and ammunition then the news spread through the force that the enemy had been discovered in large numbers upon the hill and were evidently prepared to bar the way to the wells the change affected by the news was wonderful it had been generally supposed that metemma would be reached without fighting all the spies agreeing in saying that there was no force of the enemy near the line of march in a moment fatigue and thirst were forgotten and the quiet was exchanged for bustle and animation men laughed and joked with each other in the highest spirits and all prepared for the fray with the most absolute confidence as to the result as the troops fell in the general with his staff galloped ahead to some rising ground and with their field glasses reconnoitred the hills surrounding the pass upon which numbers of white-robed arabs could be made out the hussars speedily reported that there was a considerable force in the pass below with the fighting men in front and the baggage behind the troops moved slowly forward up the hill in front and finally took up their position on a piece of flat ground whence they could see down the pass by which the arabs expected the advance would be made on the side of the hills commanding it they had thrown up small stone walls from which to fire on the hilltops out of range large numbers of arabs could be seen in constant motion gesticulating and waving their arms it was now four o'clock in the afternoon and the general decided that as the real force of the enemy was unknown it would be imprudent to attempt to force the passage with only an hour and a half of daylight before him consequently a halt for the night was ordered a strong detachment of mounted infantry and sailors with their gardener ascended a hill on the other side of the pass and set to work to build a small fort and mount the gun there a company from each of the camel regiments extended to cover the front the camels were all made to kneel their legs being lashed at the knee so that they could not rise this done the whole of the troops were set to work to build a wall there were however but few loose stones lying about and though officers and men alike worked hard the wall in front was but two feet high when the sun went down a hedge of thorny bushes and wire was raised to protect the flanks as much as possible as twilight fell a number of the enemy took possession of the top of a hill some twelve hundred yards away on the right and opened fire to which the three guns of the artillery replied with shrapnel shell the guns ceased firing when darkness came on but the enemy kept up an occasional fire all night a drink of lime juice and water was served out to all the men who then lay down with their arms in readiness to repel an attack by the little wall all night the enemy kept on beating tom-toms and occasionally yelling approaching at times comparatively close to the position 
Knowing, however, that the sentries were out in front, the men for the most part slept quietly in spite of the noise and firing. As the Arabs could fire only at random, but two men were hit during the night. In the morning it was found that the number of the enemy on the hilltops had largely increased during the night, and the bullets now flew incessantly round and over the enclosure. Lying under such shelter as the wall afforded, the men ate their breakfast of the tinned meat and biscuits they carried in their haversacks. "'I must admit, Skinner,' Easton said to his comrade, who had come across from his own company to have a chat with him, "'that this is more unpleasant than I had expected. This lying here listening to the angry hiss of the bullets is certainly trying. At least I own that I feel it so.' it is nasty skinner agreed i shan't mind it as soon as we go at the beggars but this doing nothing is as you say trying i wish they would make up their minds and come out to us or if they cannot get up their pluck enough to do it that we should sally out and attack them you may be sure we shall before long skinner they know well enough that we cannot stop here but must move on to the water sooner or later and knowing that they would be fools if they were to give up their strong position to attack us here at any rate i would rather be lying behind this wall than moving about as the general and his staff are doing major dixon has just been shot through the knee i hear there look there is another officer down i wonder who he is i do hope they won't pot clinton a few minutes later an officer passing by told them that major goff of the mounted infantry had been knocked senseless by a bullet which had grazed his forehead and that an officer of the artillery had been hit in the back what do you think of it sergeant edgar asked as he and sergeant bowen were eating their breakfast together under shelter of the wall i think that it is going to be a hot job lad if they had attacked us out in the plain we should have made short work of them but it is a different thing altogether among these hills. The beggars can run three feet to our one, and if we were to climb one of these hills to attack them, they would be on the top of the next before we got there. I see nothing for it but to move straight for the wells and let them do their worst as we go. It would be all right if we hadn't this tremendous train of camels, but if they came pouring down while we are on the march— we shall have difficulty in protecting them all. I wish Rupert were lying here with us, Edgar said, looking anxiously at his brother, whose figure he could perceive among those near the general. It is horrid lying here in safety while he is exposed to their bullets. We must all take our chances, the sergeant said. Maybe presently you will be in more danger than he is. Half an hour later orders were issued that the men were to prepare for action, and it became known among the officers that the general had determined to leave a small garrison to protect the baggage and camels in the zareba, and to push forward with the rest of the force and capture the wells, and then send back and fetch in the camels and baggage. But the movement was delayed until ten o'clock, in hopes that the enemy would attack. As they did not do so, orders were given, and the square formed up. The guard's camel corps formed half the front of the square and the right flank. The mounted infantry filled up the other half of the front and half the left flank. The rest of the left flank and the rear were formed by the heavy camel corps and the naval brigade. The hundred men of the Sussex taking the right rear corner between them and the guards, while the navy brigade with their gardener gun were in the center of the rear line between the troop of the fourth and fifth dragoon guards and that of the first and second life guards and blues in the centre behind the fighting line were two guns of the royal artillery the other having been left in the zareba while the centre of the square was filled with camels carrying water ammunition and cacolets or swinging beds for the carriage of the wounded the instant the square was formed and moved out the fire of the enemy redoubled. Swarms of natives appeared on the top of the hills, moving parallel with the advance of the square. The march was taken in slow time to allow the guns and camels to keep up. 
the ground was extremely difficult and broken deep water ruts and rocky hillocks having to be crossed and the whole very undulating and broken men fell fast and frequent halts had to be made to enable the doctors to attend to the wounded and place them in the cuckolais the front face and sides of the square advanced in fair order but there was much confusion in the rear face caused by the lagging camels skirmishers were thrown out on either side and these did their best to keep down the fire of the enemy for an hour the square proceeded and had nearly emerged from the pass on to the plain beyond when a number of green and white flags were seen at some distance on the left front as the firing had principally come from the right and as it was from that side that an attack was expected there was considerable curiosity as to the meaning of these seemingly deserted flags and a small party were about to go out to investigate them when a great number of other flags suddenly appeared at the same spot and a moment later a vast mass of arabs who had been concealed in a gully sprang to their feet they were about five hundred yards distant from the square which was at the moment halted at the foot of a stony knoll it was moved at once on to the rising ground and the skirmishers were called in the arabs with wild yells moved across the left front disappeared for a moment behind some rocks and high grass and then reappeared close to the left rear when they wheeled into line and with wild yells charged down upon the square so quick were their movements that the skirmishers had hardly time to reach the square and one man was overtaken and speared before he reached it several of the exhausted camels with their loads of wounded had been left outside lying down at the foot of the slope when the square moved up it their native drivers rushed into shelter and the wounded would have fallen into the hands of the enemy had not an officer of the guards camel corps and several privates of the heavies rushed out seized the camels and by main force dragged them into the square in the square itself there was a din of voices the officers shouting to the men to stand steady and reserve their fire until the skirmishers who were between them and the enemy had run in the instant they had done this a roar of musketry broke out from the left and rear faces of the square at first in volleys then in independent fire as fast as the men could load but though scores of the enemy fell their rush was not checked for a moment and with wild yells they fell upon the left corner of the square the men were but too deep and were unable to stand the pressure of the mass of the enemy and in a moment the rear face of the square was driven in and a hand-to-hand fight was going on between the soldiers mixed up with the struggling camels and the arabs all order was for a time lost the voices of the officers were drowned by the din of musketry the yells of the arabs and the shouts of the men each man fought for himself but their bayonets were no match for the long spears of the arabs and they were pressed back until the throng of camels pushed hard against the guards in front of the square the rear ranks of the mounted infantry on the left and the marines on the right were faced round and opened a terrible fire into the crowded mass of natives while the heavies with bayonets and clubbed muskets fought singly man to man with their foes the combat did not last long mowed down by the fire on both flanks the assailants withered away and it was not long before silence succeeded the terrible din of battle in the interior of the square the last arab of those who had pierced the square had fallen and the fire of the outside faces of the square had prevented them from receiving any reinforcement from their friends and these now fell back sullenly before the leaden hail as soon as they had done so there was time to investigate what had taken place in the centre of the square a terrible sight presented itself the ground was strewn with bodies of the natives mingled with those of men of the corps that had formed the rear face of the square the fourth and fifth dragoon guards naval brigade first and second life guards and the sussex among them lay camels which had been hamstrung or speared by the natives broken cuckolais and water-tanks and skins 
medical stores, and a confusion of articles of all kinds. Although forced back by the sheer weight of the native attack, the heavies had never been completely broken up. They maintained their resistance to the end, jammed up as they were against and among the camels, and thus enabled the men on the two sides of the square to concentrate their fire on the Arabs. A loud cheer had broken from the square as the enemy retreated, and they were prepared to resist another onslaught, for only a portion of their foes had yet been engaged with them. However, the enemy contented themselves with keeping up a distant fire from the hills, and then, doubtless as the news spread how terrible had been the loss of those who had charged the square, they gradually drew off, and all became quiet. The square now moved off from the rocky knoll upon which they were crowded, and the work of seeing who had fallen and of assisting the wounded began. No less than nine officers had been killed and nine wounded, the greater portion of them belonging to the heavy camel regiment. Two officers of the naval brigade were also among the killed. Eighty of the rank and file were killed, and upwards of a hundred wounded. Among the whites lay hundreds of dead Arabs, while arms of all sorts, spears, javelins, muskets, clubs, hatchets, swords, and knives, banners, and banner staffs were everywhere scattered thickly. Among the killed were Colonel Burnaby, Majors Goff, Carmichael, and Atherton, Captain Darley, and Lieutenants Law and Wolfe, all belonging to the heavies. To the survivors of those corps who had formed the rear face of the square, the scene they had gone through seemed a wild and confused dream. Sergeant Bowen and Edgar had been among those who rushed out and hauled in the camels with the wounded just before the Arabs came up. As they got them inside the ranks, the roar of fire broke out, and they fell into their places. "'Independent firing!' the officer shouted, as the first volley had been discharged. But scarcely had the roll of musketry begun than through the smoke a dense mass of black figures appeared. A storm of spears and javelins were poured in upon them, and in an instant there was a crash as club, spear, and sword struck the muskets, and then the heavies were hurled back. Edgar scarce knew what had happened, but the instant the square was broken, Sergeant Bowen threw himself beside him. "'Steady, lad, steady,' he said. "'Don't throw away a shot. Load and stand ready to shoot the first man who falls on you.' "'That is good,' he said, as Edgar shot a tall Arab who was rushing at him with uplifted spear. "'Load again. Now it is my turn.' And he brought down a man, and so firing alternately, sometimes defending themselves with their bayonets, but always keeping together, they fell back. Once Edgar stumbled and fell over the body of one of his comrades, but the sergeant seized him by the shoulder and jerked him onto his feet again, and the next moment ran an Arab through who was rushing at them with uplifted hatchet. When they were back among the crowd of camels, the fighting became more even. Stubbornly the men made a stand here, for the natives could no longer attack them except in front while the roar of fire from the troops on the flanks told with terrible effect upon the Arabs. "'Thank God that is over,' the sergeant said, as the fight ended. "'Are you badly hurt, lad?' "'I am not hurt at all,' Edgar said. The sergeant pointed to Edgar's left arm. The latter uttered an exclamation of surprise. He had bayoneted an Arab in the act of striking at him, and in the wild excitement had for the moment been unconscious that the blow of the native had taken effect. It had missed his shoulder, but had cut a deep gash in the arm, almost severing a strip of flesh down to the elbow. I had not the least idea I had been touched, he said. I don't think there is any great harm done. The principal arteries are on the other side of the arm. We must stop the bleeding anyhow, the sergeant said. I will soon find a bandage. There are sure to be plenty about for the surgeons were at work when they broke in. He was not long in finding one, and then assisting Edgar off with his coat, he bandaged up his arm. "'You have got a wound on the side, sergeant,' Edgar exclaimed suddenly. "'It is of no consequence, lad. A fellow threw a spear at me. I tried to dodge it, but was not quite quick enough, and it grazed my side. 
it is more than a graze it looks like a deep cut just undo your belt well give me your handkerchief i will roll that and mine into a pad and shove it in and put a bandage tightly round my waist to keep it there that will do for the present that will do nicely he said as edgar fastened the bandage round him now we shall both do very well until the surgeons have time to tie us up properly i am afraid they will have serious cases enough to last them all night now what is the next move i wonder i am horribly thirsty so am i edgar agreed are you both wounded an officer asked coming up with two men carrying a water skin yes sir but not seriously we are awfully thirsty then you can have a drink of water the officer said there is little enough of it and it is kept strictly for the wounded many of the men standing near looked on with envious eyes for all were suffering horribly from thirst several fainted and the men's lips were black and swollen and in some cases the tongue swelled so that the mouth could not be closed the nineteenth were out searching for the wells but for a long while their search was in vain the general was about to give the word to retire to the zareba where there was a little water still left when the hussars fortunately hit upon the wells the wounded who were unable to walk were at once carried there and the troops followed and halted near them and in a short time the thirst of all was satisfied although the water was not to be compared with that at gactel being found in shallow pools one or two feet deep and stirred up by the arabs till it was almost at the consistency of thin cream nevertheless it was water and was enjoyable indeed End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of dash for khartoum this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah dash for khartoum by george alfred henty chapter twelve metama as soon as the thirst of the men was satisfied the troops formed up for the night on some rising ground near the wells where it was probable that the natives might renew their attack volunteers were called for and three hundred men from the various corps started to march back to the zareba to bring in the baggage before daylight it was a heavy duty after such a day's work but those who remained behind had reason almost to envy those engaged in active work for the night was terribly cold the men had left everything behind as they advanced prepared for action and had no blankets and nothing but their shirts and their suits of thin serge to protect them from the cold the surgeons were at work all night attending to the wounded no alarm was given by the outposts during the night and as when morning broke there were no signs of the enemy the men were allowed to fall out a herd of lean cattle left by the arabs was discovered not far off and the hussars went out in pursuit of them the tired horses were however no match in point of speed for the cattle but a few of them were shot cut up and a supply of fresh meat for the day secured at seven o'clock the baggage train came up the camels were quickly unloaded and the men set to work to prepare breakfast having had nothing to eat since the meal they had taken the previous morning under fire in the zareba during the day the dead were buried the arms left by the natives collected and destroyed and a stone enclosure commenced near the wells for here the wounded were to remain under the protection of a small force of the sussex both edgar and the sergeant protested that they were perfectly capable of continuing the march and were permitted to take their place in the ranks again at four o'clock the force formed up and half an hour later set out it was given out that the march would be a short one and they would presently halt for the night but as the hours went on it became evident that the general had determined to keep straight on for the river a distance of twenty-six miles from the wells it was known that there was a considerable force of the enemy at metemah 
and as this would be augmented by the addition of the thousands of arabs who had been engaged on the previous day it was probable that were the enemy aware of the advance of the force a battle even more serious and desperate than the first would have to be fought before reaching the nile the object of the night march then was to reach the river before they were aware that the column had started from the wells the nile once gained and a supply of water ensured the force would be able to withstand any attack made on it nevertheless it would have been far better to have risked another battle in the open than to have made a night march across an unknown country the guides differed among themselves as to the route to be pursued and more than once the column marched in a complete circle the advance guard coming up to the rear thick groves of mimosa were passed through causing the greatest confusion among the baggage animals great numbers of these lay down to die unable to proceed a step further and the transport of all kinds got mixed up together in the most utter confusion the men who had had but little sleep for two nights were unable to keep awake on their camels and in their passage through the bushes many of the animals straggled away from the main body sergeant bowen had managed to place edgar next to himself upon the plea that being wounded he wanted to keep his eye upon him being both weakened by loss of blood they were less able to resist the pressure of sleep than the others and when their animals got separated in the passage through the mimosa grove from the main body and stopped to crop the leaves they were unconscious of what had happened until edgar woke with a start as one of the boughs his camel had pushed aside struck him smartly in the face his exclamation roused the sergeant hello what has happened i don't know what has happened edgar said but it seems to me that we are alone here we must both have been asleep and these brutes must have separated from the column this is a pretty mess this is the sergeant said i cannot hear anything of them and there was row enough in the rear with the baggage to be heard miles away what on earth are we to do lad well we were marching nearly south the southern cross was almost dead ahead of us we had better steer by that and go on ahead until morning the camels were at once set in motion and for hours they plodded on all desire for sleep had been completely dissipated by the excitement of the situation and they talked in low tones as to what they were to do if they could make out no signs of the column when day broke they agreed that their only plan was to keep on until they got to the river and that when they arrived there they would water the camels and give them a feed and after a rest start on foot along the bank one way or the other until they found the column there is safe to be a lot of firing the sergeant said for even if the arabs don't discover the force in the morning before they get to the river they are certain to turn out to attack them as soon as they get there judging by the pace we were going and the constant halts for the baggage to come up there is very little chance of the column getting to the river before daylight and as we have nothing to delay us i expect we shall be there before they are in one respect that will be all the better edgar said for as soon as the natives make out the column they will be swarming all over the country to look for stragglers whereas if we are ahead of them we may get through to the river without being noticed i don't think that it will be very long before morning breaks and do you know sergeant i think our camels are going faster than they were i think so too lad that looks as if we were getting near the water and they smell it just as the first signs of daybreak were apparent in the east the character of the country changed and they could make out clumps of trees and as the light grew brighter cultivated ground ten minutes later they both gave a shout of joy as on mounting a slight ascent the river lay before them a few minutes later they were on its bank the camels rushing down put their noses into the water their riders slipped from their backs regardless of the fact that the water was knee-deep and wading back to the shore threw themselves down by the edge and took long draughts of the clear water then throwing off their clothes 
they rushed in and indulged in a bath the camels after filling themselves nearly to bursting lay down in the stream until the sergeant and edgar went out and compelled them to return to shore when they set to work cropping the long grass that grew abundantly there while their riders sat down and made a meal from the contents of their haversacks well at any rate the sergeant said we can do nothing just at present the troops may be within a mile and they may be ten miles off there is no saying there is nothing for us to do but to wait until we hear something of them if we do not hear anything of them we shall know that they either have not struck the river or have struck it so far off that we cannot hear the guns in that case my opinion is that we may as well rest here for to-day before we move i think it will be decidedly better to take the saddles off the camels and hide them in the bushes and then move away some distance and hide up ourselves this is evidently a cultivated country and if there are any natives about they will be sure to see the camels so we had better not be near them there is no fear of the animals straying they will be eating and drinking all day the saddles were accordingly removed from the camels backs and hidden the two men went back a few hundred yards from the river and lay down amongst some bushes edgar was just dropping off to sleep when the sergeant exclaimed listen they are at it edgar at once roused himself and distinctly heard the boom of a distant gun that is one of the seven pounders the sergeant said and i think i can hear the sound of musketry but i am not sure about that presently however the wind brought down distinctly the sound of dropping shots skirmishing lad i suppose the enemy are hovering about them but haven't come to close quarters yet it is horrible being here instead of with them edgar exclaimed as he rose to his feet it is no use thinking of moving lad they are four or five miles away certainly and as the arabs are probably all round them there wouldn't be the slightest chance of our joining them there is nothing to do but to wait here the sound comes from inland so it is certain they have not got to the river yet as far as i can judge it is pretty nearly behind us so when they lick those fellows they are likely to come down on the river somewhere near this point they will be down before evening you may be sure they had not got water enough to last them through the day so they must move forward however many of the natives may be in their way it is not like the last business then they were on us almost before we knew they were coming but in this flat country we shall have plenty of warning and i will bet a year's pay they don't get up to our square again i think lad i will get you to set my bandages right again edgar uttered an exclamation of alarm there was a large dark patch on the sergeant's trousers in dressing after their bath the bandages had shifted a little and the bleeding had recommenced it was evident at once to edgar that a great deal of blood had been lost for sergeant bowen lay faint and exhausted upon the ground unknown to himself the action of the camel had set the wound off bleeding during the night and although he had said nothing to edgar about it he had with difficulty walked up from the river to their hiding-place edgar ran down to the river with the two water-bottles when he returned he found his companion insensible he unbuttoned his tunic and got out the wound from which blood was still flowing he washed it made a plug of wet linen and with some difficulty bandaged it tightly after some time the sergeant opened his eyes don't try to move edgar said i have staunched and bandaged the wound and you will be better soon it is a bad job lad just at present when we want to be up and doing there is nothing to do at present sergeant we have only to wait quietly until our fellows come down to the river and then i will soon get you assistance do you hear the firing still it is just as it was edgar replied after listening attentively for a moment then i expect they have formed another zaraba as they did at abu Klea, and that they will leave the camels there and march straight down to the river i will steal up to the edge of the desert if you don't mind being left alone a bit i shall be able to judge then how far they are off do so lad i am all right here 
but do not be too long away or i shall be anxious edgar made his way a quarter of a mile back some cultivated fields stretched before him and beyond them the rolling hillocks of the desert he could see men on horseback and foot moving about and looking to the right saw about half a mile distant a place of some extent which was he felt sure metama numbers of men were pouring out from the town the firing was not straight ahead but somewhat to the left if they attack metama at once we shall be all right he said to himself if they march straight down to the river we shall be all right still we shall only have to move along to them it is lucky we did not strike the river above the town for it would have been next to impossible to get round to them without being observed he went back to his companion and told him what he had seen there is evidently going to be another tough fight before they get down to the water the sergeant said it is very hard our being cut off here not that i should be good for any fighting if i were with them i have no great desire to be in another fight like the last edgar said one go at that sort of thing is quite enough for me the hours passed slowly the sergeant slept a good deal and anxious as edgar was he too several times dozed off presently he exclaimed the fire is becoming much heavier sergeant and it is nearer too listen it is the arabs lad the sergeant said raising himself on his elbow it is heavy but it is nothing like the roll of musketry you hear when our fellows begin but as you say it is much nearer the column or part of it is on its march towards the river five minutes later a dull continuous rattle came to their ears they are at it now they have stopped he said a minute later when the roar suddenly ceased what has happened now i wonder ah there they are again that is more like it steady and even the musketry came in sudden crashes volleys the sergeant said they are near them for three or four minutes the sounds continued and then there was silence they have beaten them off the sergeant said they didn't let them get near them this time i expect if they had there would have been independent firing as long as you hear volleys you may be sure our fellows are not pressed beyond an occasional shot the firing had ceased how far do you think they are away now sergeant if they were four miles before i don't think they are more than two now and a good bit more away to the left they are making to the river so as to establish themselves there before they tackle metama then in half an hour they will be down on the river edgar said i will wait that time and then start and get a party to bring you in you had better wait until to-morrow morning lad we can do very well until then i may be able to crawl by that time anyhow they will have their hands full this afternoon they will have to make a zareba by the river attend to the wounded and perhaps send back a force to bring in the camels and baggage who were no doubt left behind at the spot where they were firing this morning there is grub enough in the haversacks to last us until to-morrow and plenty of water for the fetching just as you think best sergeant my shoulder is smarting a good deal and i shall be all the better for a few more hours rest myself it will soon be getting dusk so i will go down and get another supply of water at once and then we can do a good twelve hours sleep without fear of being called up for outpost duty we have got three or four nights sleep to make up it was broad daylight before they awoke the sergeant got on to his feet but it was evident to edgar that he was altogether unfit for walking shall i saddle your camel for you sergeant no lad i will stay where i am like enough the arabs will be swarming about just within gunshot of our camp they are obstinate beggars and do not know when they are fairly beaten if i were as active as you are we might manage to get through on foot but a man on a camel would be sure to be seen be very careful lad how you go remember if you are seen you are lost for these fellows could run you down to a certainty and your only chance is to get through without being noticed i don't like leaving you sergeant but you must leave me lad we have no food to speak of left 
and it will be just as dangerous to-morrow or next day as it is to-day besides your duty is with the corps every musket may be needed and the sooner you go the sooner i shall be fetched in very well then i will start at once edgar said he first went down to the river filled the two water-bottles and placed them both by the sergeant's side and emptied what little food remained in his haversack now you will do for a couple of days if anything should occur to prevent them from sending out i shall do very well lad it is not of myself i shall be thinking but of you the gladdest sound that ever fell on my ears will be the tramp of infantry for then i shall know that you have got safely through good-bye lad and god bless you edgar wrung the sergeant's hand and unable to trust himself to speak turned and started through the wood he had not gone very far when he found that the grove was by no means a large one for the trees opened before him he bore to his left hoping that they would extend along the river bank but it was not so the grove was isolated and a large patch of cultivated land stretched down to the river half a mile further there was another grove but whether this was more extensive than that in which he now was he had no means of telling standing at the edge of the trees he could see several figures on horseback moving about and saw at once that they were natives the hussars will want two or three days rest i expect he said before their horses are fit to go out and drive these fellows into the town well here goes and he descended the bank of the river which was now low and kept along under its shelter until he reached the next grove it seemed so much safer where he was than it would be above that he determined to keep under shelter of the bank until he reached the camp he had gone a hundred yards farther when there was a sudden exclamation on the bank above him and almost at the same instant a spear struck his helmet from his head he turned round and brought his rifle to his shoulder but in a moment the arab on the bank was joined by a score of others who with loud yells rushed down upon him he saw that to fire was to ensure his death and that resistance was worse than useless he therefore threw down his gun and held up his arms the arabs rushed upon him in a body with uplifted spears and swords but on an order sharply given by one who seemed to be their leader they lowered these edgar was however knocked down kicked and beaten then some cords were placed round his body and arms and he felt himself lifted up and carried away he was thrown down again in the wood and an animated and as it seemed to him angry discussion was carried on some time he had picked up a good many arabic words but not enough to enable him to understand the discussion but he had no doubt that the subject of the dispute was whether he should be killed at once or carried away prisoner as after a time he was lifted up the cords round his legs taken off and he was hurried along with many curses and an occasional sharp prick with a spear he judged that those in favour of sparing his life for the present had won the day his own prospects seemed desperate but for the time he was more concerned at the thought that the man who was perhaps his father was lying helpless in the wood vainly expecting his return but he did not consider his case altogether hopeless as soon as the troops were all assembled on the river bank they would be sure to move forward against metama and even if they did not pass through the wood the sergeant might gain sufficient strength to reach its edge get sight of them and join them unless one or other of these alternatives took place he was lost as to himself he could not blame himself for the misfortune that had befallen him he had taken what seemed by far the safest course and had it not been for the accident that one of the arabs had been standing at the moment at the edge of the river he would have got through safely his captors had evidently no fear of being attacked probably the column that had gone out to fetch in the baggage had not yet returned and the small force left at the zareba on the river bank would certainly not undertake any offensive operation until it came back he was sorry now 
that he had not persisted in his own opinion and remained with the sergeant as in another day or two some scouting party might have passed near the grove in which they were concealed however it might have made no difference the arabs were evidently swarming about the country and parties would be likely to occupy that wood just as they occupied the one nearer to the english camp as they approached the village the arabs raised shouts of triumph and a crowd gathered as they entered the street gesticulating and screaming so furiously that edgar thought he would be torn to pieces however his captors forced their way through the crowd turned off from the street and entered a courtyard in the centre of which stood a house of larger size than the majority of those that composed the town edgar's legs were again tied and he was thrown into an outhouse where he lay for hours he could hear almost continuous talking in the house and the voices occasionally rose into angry altercation he was surprised that he had not been killed as he entered the place for the arabs if they fought with the same courage as those engaged at abu Klea, must have suffered very heavily before they fell back and the friends and relatives of those who had fallen would be thirsting for vengeance upon any european who fell into their power then he considered that it was probable that the people of metama itself who lived by the passage of caravans and the river traffic would at heart be as much opposed to the mahdi as were those of khartoum and other cities the force with which the british had fought at abu Klea was composed partly of the mahdi's regular followers partly of wild tribesmen animated alike by mohammedan fanaticism and the hope of plunder and although these might unite in an attack against christians they had little love for each other the band into whose hands he had fallen might be townspeople but more probably were members of some tribe that had been summoned to arrest the progress of the troops going up to the relief of khartoum now that he was detained a prisoner instead of being at once killed edgar felt that there was a strong chance for him in a couple of days the force might attack metama and in that case he might be rescued it was however a place of considerable size and containing at present a very large number of fighting men and after the losses the column had suffered in the first fight and during its subsequent encounters general stuart might well hesitate to risk still greater loss than he had already suffered by an attack upon the place it was probable that the mahdi would send down a large body of troops from those besieging khartoum as soon as he heard of the arrival of the small british force on the river and every gun might be needed to maintain the position and repel attacks until the arrival of reinforcements across the desert thus edgar felt it to be very doubtful whether any attack would be made for the present of course as soon as reinforcements arrived or the boat column came up the river metama would be captured but by that time he might be hundreds of miles away the boat column might not get round for six weeks while all reinforcements coming across the desert from cordy would have to march for edgar felt sure that it would be a long time before the camels were in a condition for work again it was well that when he filled the two water bottles for the use of the sergeant edgar had taken a long drink for no one came near him until after dark and he suffered a good deal from thirst and from the pain caused by the tightness with which he was bound he began to think that he had been altogether forgotten when the door of the outhouse opened and two arabs came in and seizing him as if he had been a package dragged him out into the courtyard then he received two or three kicks as an intimation that he could sit up but this roped as he was he was unable to accomplish and seeing this the men pulled him up against a wall and raised him into a sitting position against it a fire was burning in the centre of the courtyard on some cushions in front of it sat a man whom he recognized as the leader of the party who seized him other arabs were squatted on the ground or standing around the chief was past the prime of life 
but still a powerful and sinewy man his features were not prepossessing but edgar looking round thought that the expression of his face was less savage than that of the majority of his followers does the christian dog speak the language of the prophet he asked i speak a little arabic edgar replied inwardly congratulating himself upon the trouble he had taken to pick up a little of the language during the time he had been in egypt the answer was evidently satisfactory the chief bowed his head it is good he said the kaffir is henceforth a slave in the tents of the sheik bakhat of the jaran tribe as he pointed to himself edgar understood that his captor intended to keep him as his own property at any rate for the present and bowed his head to signify that he understood why are the english foolish enough to come here the sheik asked they must know that they cannot stand against the power of the mahdi they did not come to interfere with the mahdi but to bring back their countrymen gordon and his friends from khartoum they will never reach khartoum the sheik said their bones will whiten in the desert edgar did not reply partly because his knowledge of arabic was insufficient for a discussion partly because it was not worth while to run the risk of exciting the anger of the chief by pointing out that as they had failed to prevent a thousand men crossing the desert to metama they might similarly fail in preventing a force of seven or eight times that amount marching up the banks of the river to khartoum he therefore remained silent the mahdi is invincible the sheik went on after a pause he will conquer egypt and after that will destroy the kaffirs and take their city of rome and will capture constantinople if the turks deny his authority the mahdi is a great man edgar said gravely although with difficulty repressing a smile who can say what may happen then seeing that this answer was also considered satisfactory he went on your slave is hungry and thirsty he has been wounded and his bonds hurt him greatly if he is to be of use to you will you order that food and drink be given him the chief nodded and at a motion of his hand two of his followers freed edgar from his bonds and a dish containing some boiled meal and a jug of water were placed beside him edgar drank deeply but was only able to take a few mouthfuls of food as he was feverish and in considerable pain for the wound in his arm which would have been comparatively slight had proper attention been paid to it was inflamed and angry and the arm greatly swollen as no further attention was paid to him he returned to the outhouse took off his khaki tunic and tearing some strips from it wetted them and laid them on his shoulder presently the door was closed and he heard a heap of brushwood thrown against it an effectual way of preventing an attempt to escape for as the door opened outwards the slightest movement would cause a rustling of the bushes and arouse the arabs who were sleeping in the courtyard there was no window edgar seeing that escape was out of the question laid himself down and tried to sleep but the pain of his arm was so great that it was some hours before he succeeded in doing so the next morning he was allowed to go out into the yard and for some time no attention was paid to him then a considerable hubbub was heard in the town with much shouting and yelling an arab ran in at the gate with some news edgar could not understand his hurried words but the effect was evident the men seized their arms and then at the sheik's order edgar was again securely bound and fastened in the outhouse in the course of an hour he heard firing first dropping shots and then two or three sharp volleys and knew that the british were advancing against the town and that the arabs had gone out to skirmish with them then there was a long pause and he heard the sound of the english field pieces he listened for musketry but in vain it is only a reconnaissance he said to himself those little guns would not batter down the mud walls round the town without an expense of ammunition that could not be afforded no doubt the troops would take it by storm but surely the general would not risk the heavy loss they would suffer before they got in 
especially as the place would be of no use to them when they took it, and must fall as a matter of course when the rest of the force arrives. Such being his opinion, he was but little disappointed when the firing ceased, and he knew by the triumphant yells of the Arabs that the British force were retiring. In a short time he heard a clamor of voices in the courtyard, and he was presently unbound and released. The Kaffirs did not dare to attack the place, the Arabs said exultantly. They have gone back to their camp. In a day or two there will be forces here from Khartoum and Berber, and then we will destroy or make slaves of them all. Four days later there was a great firing of muskets and triumphant yelling in the streets. Edgar felt very anxious, fearing that the expected reinforcements had arrived, and that a tremendous attack was about to be made upon the camp. He did not believe that it had already taken place, for he felt confident that every pain had been taken to strengthen the position, and that in whatever numbers the assault might be made it would be repulsed. Presently, however, the sheik himself deigned to tell him the cause of the rejoicing. "'There is news from Khartoum,' he said. "'The city has been taken, and the Englishman Gordon and all his followers have been killed. The news is certain. It has been brought down to us by tribesmen on both sides of the river. I told you that the Mahdi was irresistible.' The blow was a terrible one to Edgar. In the first place it was grievous to think that the expedition had been made in vain, and that, owing to those in authority at home delaying for months before making up their minds to rescue Gordon, it had failed in its object, and that the noblest of Englishmen had been left to die, unaided by those who had sent him out. He thought of the intense disappointment that would be felt by the troops, of the grief that there would be in England when the news was known, and then he wondered what would be done next. It was evident to him at once that his own position was altogether changed. He had before felt confident that unless his captors moved away from the town before the arrival of the main body of the expedition, he should be rescued. But now it seemed altogether uncertain whether the expedition would come at all. So long as Gordon was alive, England was bound to make every effort to rescue him. But now that he and his companions were dead, and Khartoum had fallen, she might not feel herself called upon to attempt the conquest of the Sudan. It was probable, however, that this would be the best, and in the end the cheapest way out of the difficulty. Here was a force that had, at an enormous expense, been brought up almost to within striking distance of Khartoum and which could be relied upon to make its way thither to defeat the armies of the Mahdi and to recapture Khartoum without any very great difficulty. The provisions and stores had all been purchased and brought up, and scarce any outlay additional to that already incurred would be entailed by the operation. Upon the other hand, to retire now would be to leave the whole Sudan in the hands of the Mahdi and his fanatics it would mean the destruction of the settled government established by the Egyptians, and it would expose Egypt to incessant invasions, which we should be bound to repel. Common sense, humanity, and even economy seem to favor the advance of the force to Khartoum. The British people, roused to anger by the fate of Gordon, would probably call loudly for the vindication of the national honor, and for an act of retribution on the murderers of Gordon. But Edgar felt that another way out of the difficulty might present itself to the authorities at home. It was not unlikely that the counsels of those who, from the first, had been against the expedition would prevail, and that it would retire to Egypt without striking another blow. In that case it seemed that there was nothing before him but lifelong slavery. Edgar, however, was at an age when hope is not easily relinquished. I may be a slave a long time, he said, but sooner or later I will escape. I will get to speak the language like a native. I am already almost burnt to their color, and shall ere long be able to pass as one of themselves. 
it is hard indeed if after a time i cannot manage to escape and make my way either back to egypt or down to the red sea or into abyssinia if i did not feel sure that i could do either one or the other i would do something that would make them kill me at once End of chapter twelve